Am I on, Ian? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks uh, to Pastor Willie for letting me do this, and then thanks to all of you for coming out here and supporting me and to hear the Word of God. Um, so I know that Pastor Willie already prayed, but I would like to as well. So if you would bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for giving us this night for us all to come out here. I thank you for giving me this opportunity to practice uh, preaching your word, God. And I just pray that you guide me, not only tonight, but for the rest of my life as I continue to devote myself to you and your word. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. So whenever I started writing this, I was like, um, I guess I'll do it over the Romans road. You know, that's always a good thing to preach over. But then this quote came to me that, now it is from a video game, but <laughs> it, <laughs> it's by St. Thomas Aquinas, or however it's pronounced. Um, and it says, three things are necessary for the salvation of man, to know what he ought to believe, to know what he ought to desire, and to know what he ought to do. So where I was going to just preach on the Romans road, I felt like it would be beneficial to go more in depth than just that. So I didn't have a better title than just the gospel, but I mean, what can be a better title than that, right? <clears throat> so uh, Genesis 1-1 starts out as, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So who is this God? Later in the Bible, Exodus 3.14, he says to Moses that he is I am. Uh, the Hebrew for that is Yahweh, which um, shows God's omnipresence. God with us always. God does not have a limit, which is why he was before the beginning of time, why he is even to this day, and why he always will be forever and ever. <clears throat> so, it is a hard concept to understand, but I guess the best way I could try to write it down or explain it is God is because God is. Uh, so he created the heavens and the earth, the birds and the fish and all the land, animals, etc., etc. And then he created man. So, but why? I mean, <clears throat> God did not create us because he needed us. Acts 17, verses 24 and 25 say that the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. So he didn't create us for us to help sustain his power. He doesn't need us to do that. He, didn't, he also didn't create us because he was lonely. Genesis uh, 126 says, is God the Father saying, let us make mankind in our own image. God the Father had perfect companionship with the other two parts of the Trinity, both the Son and the Holy Spirit. So why did he create us? Jeremiah 31 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. This is the kind of love God has for us, and it's a concept we fail to fully understand. Before anything was even here in this universe, God loved us, and because he loved us, he created us to enjoy what he had created. So he created Adam and then Eve. Unfortunately, though, uh, humans have this uh, thing called sin in their lives. Um, humanity's corruption is told in Genesis 3, with Eve being tempted by the serpent, which is Satan, and then succumbing into the temptation, sinning, and then Adam doing the same. So by their temptation, sin was born. From sin, separation from God, and then death. Now, it sounds pretty bad from here. I mean, separation from God and death, not something you want to experience. But God does give us a promise in Genesis 3.15, which says... I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. 
He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So we are not hopeless in the fact that despite our sin, which does eventually lead to death, God still has a plan for us, a way back to him. But for now, humanity is still corrupted and we have a tendency to continue turning away from God. Um, The best verses I found to sum up humanity is Judges 3, 7, and 12, which say, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then verse 12 says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So despite the fact that we do evil, um, in between those verses, a judge appears, which is a leader of the Israelite people. And he restores peace to the Israelites. But after he died, again, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So sin continues to increase. The evil in the world continues to increase. And there is still no sign of the Messiah, which is the promise God gave to us back in Genesis. But God still has not abandoned us which can be seen through him speaking through the prophets. Um, I will be using Isaiah for today. Isaiah seven fourteen says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will, and will call him Emmanuel. <coughs> and then I'm going to flip over to Isaiah 53, verses three through five. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and was held in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain. Oh, well, there's my seven minute mark. For those of you who don't get it, Pastor Willie's first sermon was seven minutes long. So I decided, if I can beat that, I'm doing good. (laughs) You're a pro now. (laughs) Uh, um, I'll continue with verse five. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. So again, we are reminded by God that there is still hope despite how bad it is looking for us. And then 730 years later, the Savior is born um, as the baby, Jesus Christ. And only a handful of people at the time knew of this extraordinary event. And um, going back to Isaiah 7, they say that his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. God in the flesh incarnate came to dwell with a fallen mankind. So, Jesus did amazing things in his life here on earth. He cast out demons, healed the sick, healed the lame, healed the dead, taught how one should live one's life to glorify God, and lived that perfect life that he spoke of. One thing that I feel that we forget, though, is that God chose to do that. He didn't have to come and dwell with us, but because of that everlasting love that um, he talks about in Jeremiah, he chose to. And that everlasting love goes as far that he would even die for us, which he showed on the cross. Now, I don't want to just necessarily breeze through uh, the crucifixion and skip to his resurrection. Spoiler alert. Uh, but the crucifixion throw shows three things. The corruption um, of the religious leaders and their fixation on outwardly appearance, the corruption and evil of mankind, and then God's grace. The religious leaders of Jesus' time were doing everything right on the outside from what they thought. They were no longer focused on serving God and trying to become more godlike, but instead on a man-centered religion. On the inside, they were corrupted. Jesus 
even at one point did end up calling them a den of vipers. So because of this inwardly corruption, they hardened their hearts towards Jesus and his message of how they should stop fixating on outwardly things and trying to please man and instead focus on what's on the inside, the soul, the spirit, and trying to please God. <clears throat> In fact, uh, the religious leaders' hearts were so hardened that they did begin to plot to kill Jesus, which became successful. Jesus was to be crucified under Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor at the time. Pontius Pilate did attempt to spare Jesus and instead offered the crowd that had formed a murdering thief called Barabbas. But the religious leaders went through the crowd and they convinced the crowd, or at least attempted to convince the crowd, to free Barabbas and crucify Jesus. And they did successfully do it. The crowd knew who Jesus was. They knew of his teachings, his life, and his miracles. And yet they still chose to crucify him because the religious leaders told them to. <clears throat> In Luke 23, 24, Jesus says, Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. Uh, referring to the crowd and the horrible sin they were committing of killing their God. Um, God, Jesus asked that the, man, the men who killed him be forgiven. Now, more was happening than just Jesus dying on the cross. He bore all sin, past, present, future. And not only did he bear it, but he also took the punishment for it. After he did this, he said, it is finished. And he gave up his spirit to God. <coughs> that was loud. So I feel like whenever Jesus did die on the cross, Satan was probably like a little shocked because he was probably thinking, hey, I did it. Jesus is dead. I've beaten him. And then probably still surprised when they put him in the tomb saying he's still dead. Of course, though, as the song goes, our God is an awesome God and nothing as trivial as death, at least when seeing it from God's perspective, would keep him down, which can be seen in his glorious resurrection on the third day. Our human eyes tend to see death as the end too much, I mean, even us as believers, but God says no to that. He says that he has power over death, and he has proven it, that it's not the end. And better yet, as a believer, we have, have the rest of eternity with a glorious God to look forward to. But now I come to the part that no one enjoys talking about, the alternative to heaven, which is hell. No one likes talking about it, about how terrible of a place it is, separation from God eternally, eternal torment. I mean, but it's not like the torment is unjustified. I mean, we are sinful men and we do deserve the punishment for it. But Jesus did take that punishment for us and shows us his love yet again with that sacrifice. So that comes to us today and to a decision that will change our life. Either choose to believe in Jesus and who he says he is, or choose not, that he is not Lord and Savior but it is a matter, a small matter of more than just believing. Because, I mean, even Satan believes that Jesus is who he says he is. But he's not going to be in heaven. He rejected God. So it's also that we accept Lord, <laughs> accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And, I mean, you just, it's really simple. You just have to ask for his forgiveness and he will grant it. 
Now, I can't, I'm sure a couple of you are thinking, Jared, what are you doing? I mean, the gospel, you know, it's a good message to preach, but you know I'm saved. I went with you on the mission trip to North Dakota. We toured the Creation Museum together. You see me every Sunday. I do have a question then. When was the last time you told someone the gospel message? Because I don't know how each of you are doing as a messenger of God, but if I was to tell you, not including tonight, I don't know if I could remember. The world is dying and the people along with it. There is no hope in the world but one, and that is Jesus. I'm sure you are familiar with the last two verses of Matthew talking about the Great Commission, about how we are to go to the ends of the earth and to make all disciples. So what are we doing? There is a lost world out there that needs to be saved. I want to end with this. Don't become complacent. Don't give up. God is with us. That is what Emmanuel means. And he wants us to tell his message to all. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for giving us this night. I pray that these words that I said were not my words, but your words. And I pray that you just give us a boldness, Lord, to go into this dying world and preach your message. And just guide us all along the path that you would have us take and to just continue to seek you each and every day, God. I pray for the lost in the world right now that you are still working in their lives, in the lives of those around them, to affect them. And I pray that your will be done, Lord. In your holy and precious name, amen.